Okay, welcome to day two of our conference. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce our uh, keynote speakers. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to invite uh, professors Nathan Badenoch and Toshiki Osada. Um, and uh, also we're going to have a guest appearance by uh, Madhu Purti today also. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'd like to introduce all three of them actually. Uh, they're very close to me because I, I uh, stayed in Japan for three years and worked with them on a project. Um, so, uh, so Professor uh, Toshiki Osada is uh, probably one of the world's foremost experts on um, the Mundari language, which is spoken in Jharkhand. Um, he's worked on it for over 30, 40 years, maybe? Yeah, over 40 years. He did his uh, PhD um, from Ranchi University in 1980 something? Huh. Yeah. 19, yeah, 1990. He did his PhD from Ranchi University and uh, then he uh, went back to Japan and he uh, uh, is currently the Professor Emeritus at the Research Institute of, the, of Humanity and Nature, which is a national research institute in Kyoto, Japan. His, uh, after the, you know, missionary uh, grammars, his grammar of Mundari is, uh, you know, the most comprehensive grammar of the language ever written, and he's written on a number of aspects of, of Mundari grammar and is published in several peer-reviewed journals. Um, he, his, uh, he was also the head of the Indus Valley Japan India project, and so he has, in, a, in addition to linguistics, he's uh, made a name for himself in archaeology and has published several volumes. Um, on that uh, during his five-year directorship of that project. Uh, currently, um, he, along with Nathan Badenoch, um, Madhu Purti, me, um, we're working on this expressives uh, project, and he's worked quite a bit on expressives in Mundari, and he spearheaded this dictionary of, of Mundari expressives, which is one of the first uh, dictionaries of these expressives, which he'll introduce you what they are, in any Indian language. So this is quite an achievement. Um, he and, and, and Nathan uh, and uh, Madhuji have edited it. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to invite him. And then um, Professor Nathan Badenoch, his uh, original, he did his PhD from uh, Kyoto University and his original work was in water conservation and in, uh, in uh, Thailand, uh, uh, in northern Thailand. And, but while he was doing well, the water conservation work, he got very interested in, in the fact that this area was so multilingual and uh, there was many, um, a lot of the negotiations happened around language. And so he, he sort of became, you know, he sort of reset his career and became a linguist and he's worked in Thailand He's worked, he's, a lot of his work has been done in Laos um, uh, on the China border uh, and in a, in a village that people speak maybe seven or eight different languages and he knows all of them. So it's very impressive. And then he's, uh, his latest work is in India. So he's worked on Mundari and he'll be working on the Asur language in Jharkhand right after this conference. So I'm very happy to um, invite him. And... Uh, uh, Madhu Purti Madhuji, he's, she's from uh, uh, a small village in Jharkhand. I've visited the, the village. It's very only recently even has road connection. Yet she's, um, and, uh, she's done her BA, MA from Ranchi and then she went to Japan. And she really you know, brought the study of her language, Mundari, to Japan and made it something, even I learned Mundari, uh, and so many people learn Mundari, and we had to go to Japan. It wasn't even taught in India, you know. <laughs> and I learned it in Japan on, because she was there, you know. And, uh, you know, she brought the uh, Ram Dayal Munda, who was a famous uh, activist and scholar. Uh, she brought him to Japan, and they started a vibrant study of Adivasi language and culture in Japan. So she's done a lot of work for that. And 
Uh, she's helped and co-published with us several articles and um, books. We've done a course in Mundari also, which is the first, uh, one of the first textbooks in Mundari ever from Japan also. So I'm very happy to invite them here. And they'll be talking today about um, uh, expressives, which are these, in a very simple way, these onomatopoetic words, ideophones they're called, but they're actually very con complex and they really speak to the themes we're gonna talk about. So they'll be uh, speaking about uh, expressiveness and affect, uh, everyday poetics in natural landscape. So please, thank you, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nishant, for the nice introduction. And to the organizers also, thank you for having this wonderful event. Uh, such a title for the conference uh, has to get interest from many different people and places, and uh, it's very nice to be a part of it. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, expressives today. Uh-oh. Talk about expressives, and we'll do something slightly, uh, well, it will be largely uh, non-conformist in what we do today. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna share the, the duties of, of speaking, so uh, bear with us as we deal with uh, multiple people giving a keynote, which is a little non-conventional. And uh, yeah, we're gonna try to turn our attention this morning to language, language issues having to do with the theme of the, of the conference, and quite specifically language. Um, we're gonna necessarily get a little bit uh, detailed about language, so bear with us uh, in that. The, one of the worst things to do, of course, to get someone interested in language is to actually get a linguist to talk about it. Um, but we'll try to uh, do our best there. Okay, so switching glasses. Okay, I'm gonna uh, just read a few remarks at the beginning and then we'll go to a more kind of informal uh, talk uh, with the slides. Okay, the effective turn in the social sciences has opened up space for treatment of feelings, sentimentality, intimacies, and emotion in anthropology. With the framework of affect, we can challenge a range of convenient but simplistic dualisms that do not stand up to empirical investigation. Lutz and White in 86 have commented on the potential of dismantling the juxtapositions of body and mind, self and other, private and public, personal and political, and agency and structure. Evocative ethnography, elaborated by Stoller and further developed by Scoggard and Watterson, holds potential for unpacking what is really experienced and felt in social interactions through an integration of abstraction and illustration. And I think we're gonna extend that today to beyond social interactions and human nature interactions. To the list of dualisms requiring a more evocative ethnography that puts feelings and emotions at the center, we can add human and nature. Cohn, which has already got a little bit of time uh, yesterday, in his book, How Forests Think, begins the discussion of the possibility of recognizing an ecological semiosis, one that is not limited by the conceptions that define the human world, with an expressive in the Runa Quichua language in, in Ecuador, uh, depicting the sound of a pig plunging into a river. Supu is the sound. Or depending upon how big the pig is, how deep the water is, the falling action, tsupu or tsupu or tsupu, depending upon how it goes. He argues that as an expressive word, also known as idiophone, defined by the imagery evoked by sound symbolism, tsupu seems to be somehow outside of language. He argues that the forest is made up of a multitude of selves that interact with humans. It is almost as if the forest has a voice that it can use to narrat narrate these interactions without using human language. To Cohn, these interactions are semiotic, but not language-like. He asserts, convincingly, that tsupu depicts a pig plunging into the water because that is what it sounds like, and this is the imagery that it evokes among speakers of Runa Kichwa. He explains that even people who don't understand the language will feel supu when it is explained to them, and it's key to say that once it is explained to them. It must be remembered that what native speakers feel is certainly this type of relation between a sound and a meaning, but the sound symbolism that makes these words special is not universal and should rather be considered heavily mediated by linguistic culture. The study of expressives, idiophones, and mimetics has advanced in the recent years from the uneasy fringes of linguistics to a more confident intellectual space encouraged and expanded by a range 
of ethnographically motivated approaches. Dingamansa, who's one of the, the leading thinkers in this field, uh, defines idiophones, which we choose to call expressives, uh, following the tradition of uh, Gerard Diflot in South and Southeast Asia. Dif uh, Dingamansa ex uh, defines them as marked words that depict vivid sensory perception. Janice Nuckels, uh, who works on the Quechua also, uh, sees idiophones as expressions that are used to simulate through performative foregrounding the salient processes and perceptions of everyday life experience. Expressives are used by speakers to add poetic depiction to prosaic speech, showing rather than telling, depicting rather than describing. Analysis of expressives and idiophones was long fixated on the, the peculiar relationship between sound and meaning, but it has been re asserted recently that they are not simply aesthetic embellishment, but that they are central to communication itself. In the literature on Native American languages, uh, language practices and ideologies, idiophonic language in poetry shows how poets are driven by a performance that displays the speaker or writer's thinking, motivating the hearer reader to think, to see, think, and act. Yet expressive meaning remains notoriously difficult to pin down. In Santali, and this is one of the key experiences we had working on Santali, of course, in Japan, um, spoken in several states across eastern India, the word sain sain can depict several things that are rather hard to link at first. The first is when water begins to boil and the small bubbles are coming up from the bottom. This is sain sain. Or an arrow flying through the air, sain sain. Or a snake about to strike someone, sain sain. The informant's explanations are often long and remarkably vivid, but they are more than pairings of sound symbolism and experiential imagery. We found out that one of the key elements of meaning in this sign sign word is the anticipation, the feeling of anticipation you get as the water is about to begin full boiling, as the, air, the arrow is about to hit its target, as the snake is about to bite the person that it's uh, attacking. There's a strong element of effect achieved through the use of these words, creating links between speakers that are reinforced by shared norms, aesthetics, and imaginations. Iconicity means that to speakers, these words resemble what they describe. But through expressive effect, these words also resemble how speakers feel about them. Nuckels pushes the depth of the communication even further, asserting that for the runa, expressives create a sentiment of shared animacy, not between only humans, but among human and non-human as well. She says, by sonically simulating their perceptions of non-human nature, the runa enact the salient links between themselves and the non-human world. People who are overly vivid in the use of exaggerated expressions, gestures, or tones of voice might be described as affected. This is exactly what expressives do, and they bring about emotional responses from those that hear them. Kita, a Japanese linguist, has proposed that the meaning of mimetics, as these words are called in Japanese linguistics, is composed of two semantic elements, an analytical dimension and an affecto-imagistic dimension. In the affecto-imagistic dimension, multiple aspects of an experience are represented, affective, motive, and perceptive activation. This is Jakobsen's expressive function, enabling speakers to insert their attitudes towards what they are speaking about. Thus, in offering a rendition of experience itself, the speaker depicts not only images of external sensory perception, but evokes feelings and emotions that arise internally. It is assumed that the hearer can imagine and visualize the sensory perceptions through the analytical dimension of meaning, but that they are motivated to feel the completeness of the experience through the effecto imagistic. The evocative ethnography suggests the importance of language in providing a window on effect. Skoggard and Watterson again assert that effect provides a space for highlighting, examining, and privileging feelings, not just through the rational mind, and it emphasizes the part played by the structures of feeling in social activity and interaction. Thus, the study of affect as both noun and verb suggests multiple dialectics, the individual and the collective habitus and identity, emotion and relationship, consciousness and action." End of quote. Spinoza's affectus is a dialogic capacity for affecting and being affected, making it much more complex than the notion of personal feeling. In fact, it, must, it may be a pre-personal intensity that defines the relationship between bodies, environment, and others. As, as pre-personal, 
affect his non-conscious experience of intensity, a moment of unformed, unstructured potential. The interplay between noun and verb functions of the word affect itself offers ambiguity that is conveniently captured by the markedness of expressives. Nuckels shows us how expressives sound like life, but it has also been argued by us that expressives feel like life, and not only for the speaker, but for the hearer. In this paper, we will argue that expressive language is also used, is used to achieve effect, an important component of feeling and emotion that is expressed not only as an individual's experience, but as an outcome of expressive performance among hearers. To do this, we will look at expressives and expressive language in three languages, 2.5 maybe for time, spoken across South and Southeast Asia, considering expressive effect in the context of human nature interactions. First, the expressives of rain, words that are used with rain, uh, are introduced to show how the experience of nature is perceived and internalized by speakers of Mundari. That will be Professor Osada. Uh, the, the semantics of expressives for rain evoke a range of feelings associated with rain in daily life, foregrounding the impact of rain on health, livelihood, and states of mind. The data for this section were collected in the context of the dictionary that, that you've already seen, um, and is uh, very much the product of Madhuji's explanation to us of how rain and language interact uh, in daily life in the, in the village. Next, we'll demonstrate how expressives are used in a narrative performance in the Bit language, another related Austroasiatic language spoken near the Lao-China border by 2,600 people, um, where the narrator tells the story of morality based on human-animal interactions. Um, this section is partial analysis of a story that's been recorded and analyzed in the village. Um, in both, we, give, we gain insight on the intersections between individual fidgings and collective imaginations. Um, the effective resonance of expressives used to build feeling worlds that bind individuals, communities, and ecologies. Perception is given in its full sense only when it becomes experience, that is, when it becomes aesthetic. So there is no perception without feeling. Uh, just before we start to talk about Mundari and bit language, uh, just another... Uh, look at this effecto-imagistic mode of meaning, um, which is the analytical versus the effecto-imagistic. It's coming out of Japanese linguists. Um, and sort of separating these two areas, right? And this follows on from the tradition of diflot, in which two modes of phonology were identified for expressives. So the sound system, um, in which expressives utilize more of the sound system that's available to us in their words. So that means you'll have sound combinations in expressives that don't exist in prosaic words. Um, and so setting up a, a, a phonological opposition between prosaic and expressive. And this has even been taken interestingly beyond etymology in a, another Japanese linguist analysis called Tsujimura, who is looking at how morphological paradigms for expressives allow words to be borrowed in and expressivized, to be made expressive. So this is an interesting problem because if the tsupu of the pig falling into the water comes from the sound, how is it that you can still borrow a word and make it expressive if it's got a proper etymology? The sound and meaning links don't exist. Uh, we won't get into that now, but it's an interesting area which is quite important for sorting out how languages internally work uh, in terms of expressives. So there's been a, a, a hierarchy an implicational hierarchy for expressives, which is developed by Dingamansa, which was mostly to enable some cross-linguistic comparison, right? So if you've got, if you've got uh, an expressive of sound, which is the most basic onomatopoetic thing, you might have movement. If you have movement, you might have visual patterns. So if you're gonna work the other way around, if you have expressives of inner feelings and cognitive states, they can only be based upon these other lower levels in the hierarchy. What we find is that, okay, maybe you can compare across languages as this is a tool, but in terms of analyzing an expressive, this is not very useful because most of the expressives we work with have elements of all of these in their meaning. So multi sensory, and then things that are not even uh, sensory perception. Um, and that's where, that's where we're gonna speak today. So for the Mundari story, I will turn it over to Professor Osada. Thank you for uh, Nature. 
uh, I'm just talking about Mundari. Uh, actually, I'm uh, now is retired, and uh, I uh, usually I hate the theoretical framework, so I'm just <laughs> talking about the da data, Mundari data. Okay, uh, Mundari is a uh, belonging to the Munda. A uh, Kelvarian group of uh, Munda sub branch of both Asiatic language family. Talking uh, mainly Jharkhand, at the West Bengal, and Odisha. And uh, in the census of India, uh, they call it the two names, two names, Munda and Mundari. But from a linguistic point of view, both are the same language. So we classify uh, language as one. Uh, Mundari. And um, according to the census of India, 2001, the population of Mundari speaker, including uh, Munda, is approximately uh, uh, one, one, uh, one million half. Uh, that, that, that much. And uh, actually, we made uh, one language out uh, of South Asia. It is uh, uh, published from Manohan publication. So uh, if you <laughs> want to obtain it, yeah, you can contact the Manohan publication. So uh, Mundari, uh, recorded in the census of India, is a. Uh, and uh, This is a census record, 2001 and uh, 1991. Maybe the, we can get the figure 2011 already, but uh, uh, at that time it is not published yet. So, uh, so uh, of course, Bihar divided into the Jharkhand and Bihar uh, in 2001. So, uh, previous record with the Bihar. But uh, nowadays, the Jharkhand is started. So, uh, this, here is Ranchi Gumla, the uh, state is Bihar, because uh, 1991. But uh, recently, of course, those areas are uh, belonging to the Jharkhand state. And uh, we have to explain why we made a uh, Dictionary of Mundari Expression. Uh, you may know Japanese has a rich system of mimetic. And uh, Osada, as a native speaker, was well aware of the linguistic and the cultural insight that the study of expression in Mundari could provide since she began studies in the 1980s. Uh, uh, Nishant, uh, <laughs> Uh, introduced about me is uh, already 40 years <laughs> uh, working in uh, Munda language. So, uh, and uh, I carry out the three year projects starting in 2006 entitled Research on Mundari Expressive and the Creation of the Expressive Database, funded by the grant in aid from uh, Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science. It's called Kaken uh, in Japanese. And, uh, but uh, uh, Nishan already uh, talking about the, uh, I'm, I was, uh, I was uh, leader of project on environment change and industrialization uh, from 2005 to 2000, 2012. Uh, so at that time it's very busy. But in 2016, Osada was invited by Professor Nicholas Evan to the Australian National University, where she part of collect and process data on Mundari Express. Uh, and Professor Evan's support has been crucial in the production of this dictionary. And of course, it, uh, my wife, uh, Madhu Puruti, is, uh, is a great, uh, <laughs> had a big data of uh, so dictionary was in Japanese as the first research, but because uh, I, I have no competence to express uh, in English for expressive, 
no, it is very difficult. So, uh, 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 but uh, it, uh, make information uh, uh, available to the large audience. So, in that case, uh, in that time, in the nature, uh, uh, nature uh, is uh, much interesting in this uh, uh, expressive dictionary. So. Since 2016, uh, Netan Net Badanok has been working intensively with Manu Puruti, a native speaker of Mundari, who is herself the source of many of the expressions we present here, to delve into the detail of expression meaning. That, that is the process of making of expression. And uh, maybe here, uh, uh, people uh, mainly coming from uh, all, uh, India, all, all over the India. So uh, you, uh, so, uh, you are mother tongue with uh, belonging to South Asian <laughs> language. So MNO showed that not only was the presence of expression in language of the Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, or Austro-Asiatic language spoken in the subcontinent writing, but the number of similar form and meaning, as well as syntactic structure, is too much to attribute to Chan. So MNO is the uh, uh, father of, uh, uh, we, we can say, the father of South Asian linguistic area. So he is much uh, interesting in this way, uh, this work. Despite the sem seminal work by Emeno in South Asia and the similarly groundbreaking work by Defros in South East Asia, expression remain marginal to the study of language in this region. So recently the study of expression and uh, ideo home. Ideo home is a uh, is, uh, uh, same kind of thing. Is, uh, Previously, people talking about onomatopoetic, that, but nowadays, uh, ideo hon is mainly in African language and uh, expressive in mainly Southeast Asia and the South Asian language. And uh, our understanding about the relationship between sound and meaning is being challenged by diverse expressive system found around the globe. So, uh, of course, uh, Nick Evans of also, uh, ANU, he is much interested in the typological work, so uh, he encouraged us uh, to publish the uh, dictionary. So, maybe uh, your mother tongue has uh, Agulam Agulam. Of course, Hindi has, and the uh, uh, last one is Bengali, uh, our friend. Bengali uh, people uh, gave me the uh, uh, home. So Agram Bagram is a very common future in South Asian language. Uh, this is the entry from the <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this is the uh, so Bengali word is also Ogram Bagram. Ogram And uh, Jakamaka, Jakamaka is also very common future in Nishika. For example, here, if you refer to Jakamaka, they are here, Ogram and Jakamaka. Those home is very common future. Uh, S is a Sindhi, and G is Vidalati, Vidalati here. <laughs> so ja Jakamaka. Yeah, that, that, that uh, shining from the uh, same meaning. And uh, Jakamaka and also Jikimiti. Uh, but well, uh, this is also Punjabi, Jikimitina, Nepali, Asamiya, Odia, and Hindi, and Marathi. So those, uh, those, uh, what is very common uh, future in South Asian language. So this is the starting point. Uh, please make a dictionary you, uh, of your own language. <laughs>
And uh, uh, MNO, MNO uh, I'm just uh, previously talking about MNO as the uh, father of Indian linguistic area studies. So uh, he proposed the onomatopoetic aerial etymology found in Dravidian and Indo-Aryan. Uh, it's 1980, the paper. So uh, this is the onomatopoetic means uh, sound. Sound uh, uh, derived from sound, so, so gargling, rattling, such a such a thing. So here is a uh, C D I A L Matu comparative dictionary of Indo-Aryan language. D E D R means Dravidian etymological dictionary device version. So it, uh, we can find uh, such a form, and of course is. We can, uh, this is our dictionary. We have uh, uh, also uh, Karagara. With, uh, so, but uh, we have uh, two meanings. Uh, this is uh, some uh, garlic, but here, this is a sound. It's uh, almost a common future from uh, indo aryan and uh, Dravidian. But, uh, uh, for example, uh, Giji Giji. Giji Giji is, uh, it is also uh, found uh, uh, indo aryan and uh, Dravidian. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a slight meaning that slightly different. It, it is a Mali area. Okay, so we were talking about rain, beyond perception uh, experience, beyond sensory perception. And we wanted to, to understand a bit better, more about what does the use of expressives mean for understanding the human environment relations in Mundari. So we've, when we looked at all of these words with rain, we saw that there were observations about environmental conditions and events, uh, the experience of those uh, conditions and events and their direct implications, being physical, social, also mental states, and also metaphorical extension of rain to other things. So to start us off, what is experienced, involved in the experience of rain? Well, first of all, we have a lot of exper expressives that talk about the pre-rain event, so the conditions before. So we have garar gurur, the sound of thunder in the distance, bijiri bijiri, single flash of lightning, palant pilid, lightning flash across the sky, sao sao, the sound of rain as it's coming from the distance, and then of course ter ter, the sound of the frogs croaking uh, before the rain. So already we're getting a sense of the rain before it even arrives. There's a, a number of words that have to do with dripping that, as you can see, are all phonologically related. Um, we won't go into this, but as you can see and probably know from your own languages, when you mess with the vowel, you get slightly different meaning with the, uh, for the scale or the intensity of something. So we have words about dripping, um, which can be quite uh, precise in, des in describing how the rain goes. So tap tip is the scattered rain with normal size drops. Top tip, scattered rain with larger drops, right? And you can see all of these other top tip, water dripping in singular drops, top top, water dropping in big drops in one place, chotop uh, chotop, large drops dripping in a constant rhythm, and chitop chotop, chotop, uh, dropping one by one but not in a regular rhythm. So we get a, quite a, a precise and uh, nuanced idea of how the rain is. Falling and not only sound. So these, if you hear tap tip, tip tip, 
you know, sound is the primary, primary sensory, you know, kind of information you'll get. But there's also things about sort of the size of the drip, where it's happening and how it's happening. When we were talking about rain and, and about these things, um, Madhuji's description often talked about, yeah, it's this type of rain, but the important thing is how you get wet when you're in it, right? So the, there were a lot of, it took a while to figure this out, but she was often explaining about how your hair will get wet, but the, not the rest of your body, how your clothes will get wet, but it's not enough to wring them out, right? Many, a lot of very, very important detail, which you would be concerned about if you're getting caught in the rain and having to get home or to, you know, the village or something like that. So you can see, I won't go through them specifically, but you can see that we've got another paradigm of sa and ta, and then variation with the vowels. So sata shata, siti siti, soto soto, sutu sutu, these things, and then suru sutu also. Um, so getting cold also as a, as a factor of being wet, and this is obviously important if you're you know, worried about getting sick and that sort of thing. So again, we've got ideas of rain, but how we're experiencing it physically rather than describing it in terms of its, its you know, the physical features of it. Uh, light rain also has a number of, of uh, different types, all with this PS type uh, paradigm here, pusu, pusu, pusur, pusur. Um, and again, how soaked you get or you don't get is a way of describing how thick the misting rain is or how, how light it is. Um, one of a, a, a different uh, form here, Jimbiri Jimbiri, I thought was interesting because this is another type of uh, concerns with the rain was whether you should change your plans, whether you can go to work, whether you can go to the fields, whether you should stay home. And in Jimbiri Jimbiri, there's a constant misting rain. You're not sure whether it's going to get heavier or stop and very difficult to decide whether or not you should be going to the forest or the field, right? And so this is a kind of a mental state um, uh, that is evoked by this type of rain. Heavy rains, jara jara, jaram jaram. This is interesting because the M that comes on the end of the word here indicates some continuing action because M mm is a sound that continues probably. Um, and this is strong rainfall. So jara jara will not last for a long time. Jaram jaram is a long one. But the description of what happens when you're thinking of jaram jaram was interesting. So this is, this is Madhudi speaking. One cannot go outside, but we must remain inside day and night. While the rain falls, rivers and paddies are filling up. People worry about damage in the fields and the erosion of the house's mud floors. Right, so jaram jaram is actually almost an existential <laughs> concern that comes out. You're very, it's actually a, you know, a state of angst that you're getting as you hear the rain continuing to fall and you're expecting it to stop sometime. Jipir jipir. Um, also has a start and stop factor, but the interesting kind of uh, mental state that is evoked there is that the men will still go to plow the fields because the rain does not impede the work. They will not take the umbrellas and will only wear a loincloth because they know they're going to get soaked, right? So it's a, it's a hindrance, it's a, it's a bother, but it's not going to, to uh, change people's plans. Bira, uh, bira, again, rain slowing after a hard downpour the drops are large, but getting further apart. So this is a very visual type uh, perception. Um, although she explained that the initial meaning of this must have come from the sound, because as the rain slows, you can start to hear distinct drops, right? Um, but this is only a sort of a, a subsidiary uh, imagery. But what was interesting is the feeling of surprise because you thought that the rain had stopped, but it's actually still falling you're not sure if you should go out because it could start again at any minute. Um, and so Juru Kundu also, you know, getting wet, uh, people wrapping their arms around their upper bodies to keep cold, uh, to keep warm. Um, so all of these showing that, you know, a, a very, if you go back to the, the, the implicational hierarchy and just try to say, is this sound, is this movement, is this a mental state, it doesn't work, right? And often the, they're all there, and the most salient one is something that doesn't line up properly or anywhere on, the, on, the, on that sort of horizon. Uh, Professor Osada already talked a few about the, the metaphoric usages here, um, but we can put a few up. Peter, Peter, which is the starting and stopping of rain, also describes a child starting and stopping crying. 
karakara is overflow of water from a heavy rain, but it's also the sound of drinking down large quantities of arki directly from the bottle. I can't imagine the social situation that would happen. <laughs> Maybe it's when raining is happening too and you can't go outside. Uh, sara sara, the sound of water splashing down in a large quantity, but also rain as if it's being dumped out of buckets, right? Um, and then giji giji, we already heard uh, about the muddy place in front of the house and the uh, Gujarati businessman. So now we're gonna wrap up the idea of Munda here, getting into something that's a little bit more poetic, a little bit more uh, conceptual here. The link between dark skies and dark hearts, right? Weather and, and your mental states. Um, Jamjaka was described as a heavy rain where the sky is dark and it's difficult to see. And so the idea of darkness being. Um, and then there's this uh, example that we got about when it's about to rain, the sky is enclosed in heavy dark clouds, which is gul gul, gul gul, right? So the atmospheric conditions uh, bringing on a mental or emotional state. And these ideas of cloudiness, particularly gul gul, come often together in uh, combination with alai balai, which is another expressive about specifically a troubling state of mind, uncertainty and longing. So here's a song which Maduji gave us uh, about dark skies. Skies are darkening and opposing above. The heart is clouded below. You don't have an umbrella and your shari will get wet. Maybe to break up the monotony of my uh, droning on here, we can ask her to sing these uh, lines. You can hear what it actually sounds like. Someone this morning said, I don't even know what Munda sounds like. So now we can hear. Where do you want to come? Rag Chitin, June, my June may Gaya Jata. और ये बिना ताल के माने बिना ढोलक के ऐसे लोग गाते हैं तो अभी दे देंगे चेतानो लारी गुले ना गुले लतरो लारी आलाए वाला Chataru ka me sabana maina sadi golu me tana Bule 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 to be chataru ka me sabana maina sadi golu me tana Thank you so not surprisingly, there are many, many, many songs with lots of expressives and we're in the process of collecting them and we're gonna put them out in some form soon. So we see that in Mundari, the natural environment is not just something to be observed and described. Expressives associated with rain evoke images of personal comfort, seasonal passage of time, threats to livelihood and general states of mind. The non-animate world is drawn into the speaker listener realm of effect when they're used. Now we're gonna to shift to the Laos-China border to hear a little bit about the bit language. Only has 2,600 speakers. I won't say too much about it because probably you'll never hear about it again in your life. Um, luckily, even though it's a small language, it's very, very strong in the village. As Nishan said, there's six other languages spoken in the village, but one of the great indicators is that as, a, as an outsider, when I go to the village, the children would not think of speaking Lao or any other language to me, only, only their language. And so the intergenerational transmission is being done. So what we're interested in with the bit language is looking at the forest as an effective space of human-animal communication. Um, I've been thinking a bit about what Cohen was saying about whether the forest thinks and all these kind of things. I won't say too much about that specifically, but there are some interesting stuff in, in narrative performance that give an idea about how these expressives are very important for uh, 
shining light on the, the relationship. So the, the, the forest for the bit, what does it mean? What type of place is it? They interestingly got rid of the old Austroasiatic word for forest, which is bri, which is, remains in Munda as bir. Right? And they replaced it with a word which is bibat bibong, which is a type of expressive in itself, which literally means the place of vegetables and the place of meat. So you can see for the, them, the forest is a, is a livelihood place. It's somewhere where you get your sustenance from. That's not too controversial, but it's an interesting insight from the beginning, just the name. And I was thinking, what are the words that people use when they talk about the forest um, in the village and in narrative? And we hear things about wandering, waiting, hunting, discovering, following, enjoying, and playing. So it's a place where you go and often you spend two or three days there in the forest, wandering around, shooting things, maybe trapping things, hanging out with friends, drinking araki from the bottle, gara gara kind of thing, you know. And it's actually related to an ethnogenesis story that they have. So they have, and there's another ethnic group that they're very close to, and there's, uh, they understand that language, but the other people don't understand theirs. It's an unequal uh, com uh, comprehensibility, right? And so they say that this, this split happened between the two groups because of a conflict over sharing of meat. One brother got uh, a large uh, boar and gave the other brother a leg. The other one got a porcupine and gave a leg. And the other brother looked at it and said, you got an animal that's got hair that's this big, the porcupine uh, thinks, how come you only gave me such a little piece? Right? So they get into a fight and the, the younger brother gets kicked out of the village and he wanders in the forest. This, this motif is shared among many groups in Southeast Asia. You hear it with different ethnic groups. But what's interesting here is in the bit vision for, uh, version of the story, when he's expelled from the village, he's forbidden from speaking the language. And the older brother says, you go to the forest, but you will not learn our language. And the story goes that once they entered the forest, the only thing they had to do was to imitate the sound of the water following, falling, the sound of the birds chirping, and the sound of the bamboo popping during the forest, right? So their whole ethnogenesis has to do with a new language based on sound symbolism and expressives. And so this is very deep meaning for, for their, whole, uh, their whole being. I want to share with you a part of a story, which is called uh, which means a, an honest person which is a strange name of a story in this group. Usually it's an orphan, two brothers, you know, the old man and the old woman, something like this. This one is a rare story because it's about an honest person. Uh, three brothers, the three friends, decide that they're gonna have a competition to see who can become the richest, right? One of them goes and starts to steal things. One of them goes to the forest and starts shooting things to sell them. And this third guy doesn't know what to do, so he goes to the forest. Um, and I guess his idea is that he's gonna, he's gonna shoot things, right? So the story that's, that's the interesting part of the story is, is here I present. Um, and he goes uh, into the forest, he goes, Nahumintekwa <laughs> So he goes to the forest, and the first year the deer came, many of them came, and he was ready to shoot them. But he pitied them because they had to face themselves, right? Had eyes, round and bright. And so roklok is an expressive about round and bright, usually describing eyes. He has life, and he didn't shoot. Oh, he took his gun and put it down like that, right? So he, he wasn't able to shoot. He goes again to the forest, and he meets birds. And he goes, again. He looked at their faces full of life and didn't want to shoot them. So in bit, any animal that you don't know the, the sex of should be female. There's a, there's a feminine default in nature for them. But you cannot refer to an animal in the plural, right? You can't, you can't say they, it doesn't work grammatically for them, right? And so this is a bunch of birds that had come, and typically he would say go instead of nga, the, fem the feminine form. But he says nga, calling the birds him, 
while he should have been calling them she. This is because he's starting to draw a relationship between himself and the birds and the animals that he can't shoot, right? So after three years, he's not able to bring any home, home any game. He's going to lose the competition. There's nothing to eat. His wife says, Don't worry, don't feel badly. I will feed you bat bong, which is the, 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 the origin of this word, bibat bibong. So she's telling him, don't, don't feel bad. She uses a poetic construction here of repetition of AB, AC. To hurt your breath, to hurt your, to your heart. He goes back to the forest, and this time tension is building in the story, and a great hornbill flies in. Now we know that something is important is going to happen here because he's flipping around the grammar of the, of the, of the language. Normally, bit is like English, a subject, verb, object type thing. Here he puts the verb front. It flies, he switches the grammar. This is the sound of a bird alighting on a branch with his wings going and it closes, right? On the tree. The branch is going like this under the weight of the bird. That's how big it is. All totally gold. The whole thing is shining brightly. Sihriya is the, is the express. He goes on more description about gold, small details, and he comes back in jihriya, another expressive for something small, shining. So this bird, this great hornbill, be the beauty of it, comparing it with gold and how it's shining. He can't shoot this one either, right? And it's because of the ruklok again, of the face, right? Of the, the eyes. So what we have opposed here in this story of moral tension is about different ways of shining. The gold of the bird, the beautiful bird that's huge and sort of is the epitome of, you know, the, the golden egg sort of, right? Alaridis lance. Sihriya and Jiriya, which are etymologically related, but that's not the other part. Beauty, profit, something that's external. Sihriya is it's like a jacket, something on the outside, right? Something that's unattainable. He wasn't able to realize Roklok, nobility of life, internal, attainable, something that's, you know, in the eyes, he's seeing, seeing through to life. And so there's different, different ways of shining that this guy is experiencing in the forest. There's something ambiguous about the expressive that he's using and the way it's uh, having effect. He says in the story there, roklok le le When I mentioned... Uh, the idea of marketness. Expressives often don't conform to the grammar of the language. They exist outside of the grammar. It's very hard to analyze them sometimes. So he has pengale, eyes, there exist. Then he has roklok, and he has leksinkoi, have breath. Now, we could analyze this as pengale, roklok. So he has exist eyes, which are roklok. Or we could analyze this as roklok, there's something like this with bright and shining, and it has life. We, we can't tell what he's doing. But in fact, what he's doing is much more interesting than that to begin with. Normally, if you have a construction like this, he would say, to have eyes and have breath. Much like the wife said, don't worry, right? But what he's done is he's switched around this, this, this uh, poetic couplet from an A-B, A-B situation to say, and it's a completely reversed parallel construction where it doesn't matter which of the, of the, the phrases the rok lok goes with. In fact, it goes with both of them and has to be there for both of them in order to get the full meaning. And so he's you know, using a, a manipulating a poetic construction to draw the parallel between the eyes and the life through the idea of shining and, and round. So there's another bit of this which is kind of interesting that there's a transregister morality being discussed here and by transregister I mean different modes of, of language within the within the, the performance he says right is to be to be pitied right he has rup so you might understand this word rup is rupa it's a borrowed word from Lao through Lao from Pali and he uses this word, it's not used in Lao to mean face. 
but it is in this language sometimes. And so he's using the word rub, which is better described as form, more, most generally, right? To mean face, which is in the normal register of bit bengai mui, which just means eyes and nose. But it comes back to the meaning of life, sengui, which actually means only breath. So he's playing back and forth between these ideas. Using a Pali word, these guys are not Buddhists. They're not Hindu, of course, either. But this has gotten into the language as something which has a very kind of philosophical meaning for them, right? Rub. From the verb side, he uses gleh. But gleh is communicated through the roklopla, this idea of the expressive meaning, right? And this is pa patterned with the idea of le sivit, which means to have life. Sivit is a la word, which is borrowed into bit, which also comes si jiva, coming from a, a Sanskrit or, or Pali borrowing as well. So there's a, two, two layers of, of register within the language, and then these borrowed words, which are come in to use to reinforce the morality of the whole story. Obviously, the morality is what you do uh, when you have to deal with the, the, the hunter's dilemma, right? You're shooting, you're taking life in the forest. The forest is a place that's potentially dangerous precisely because the spirits of those animals that are taken could, could uh, harm you. So it's a very kind of very subtle landscape of terminology and expressivity to deal with this, this type of uh, uh, morality, which is actually quite atypical for a normal bit story. So we have been looking not only in bit, but also in, in Mundari, and we have been doing some work on expressives as moral propositions. Um, we found that many expressives have moral weight that is more semantically salient than the sensory perception, which I've already talked about. The bit human-animal relations in the forest entwine meta-narratives about shared life, uh, space, and humanity. But these meta-narratives are couched in tensions, for example, the hunter's dilemma, which are mediated through poetic language. And they create an illusion of participation, as Webster uh, described in his work of, of, of uh, Navajo not only in sensory experience, but in the moral dilemma as well. So the idea of participation, that you're actually, uh, uh, the, the, the hearer is not only getting evo e emotions evoked, but they're actually participating. It creates this, this type of illusion. Um, and since we've been moving back and forth, So I want to I want to stop with one more quick example about this this insect, which is called the slender stick bug, Siamese slender stick bug. There, you probably recognize him in how it's very difficult to recognize him in the forest. Um, and this is an example from a Tibeto-Burman language called Sida, which is about the same size. And as I was collecting animal names, came across a lot of insects with very complex names, very complex. And there's there is a kind of joking hypothesis that is around this area of studying, which is, says the smaller the insect, the longer the name. All right, there's, a, there's an inverse correlation between the body and the name, which is quite funny. In some ways, I was thinking, yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, it's not quite that way. There are many insects in this language which have only one syllable, like m is a, is a, a louse. He, uh, sorry, a flea. He is a, is a louse. One syllable words, right? But then we have this guy whose name is Tchutlu Lanutlu. Right, that's his name. And these, this word, this name, working through the consultant with the consultant about what's going on here, it turns out that this name is actually a poem in itself. We can we can see this is the these are the the lines of the poem down here. Met nested levels of of parallelism in the in the in the in the name. Um, using expressive morphology of reproduction, uh, not reproduction, reduplication, uh, vowel harmony, uh, the whole range of poetic things in this one, in this one uh, name of this one insect. And so the, the body size and the name size correlation, not quite so interesting anymore for, for this language. But what's important is the farther you get into the forest, the more expressive the names get. And I believe for the people, the more intimate they get. Because the closer to the household, the closer to human life, and the less remarkable, but also 
more wrapped up in the, the, the cycle of life and death, eating all of the domestic animals that you eat have only one or two syllables. Most of the an animals in the forest that you eat have very simple descriptive names. But the rest of the natural world is something that you don't have to worry about this exchange of life. Right? You're not going to eat this. Right? You're not going to eat most of the names that are, that are quite long. And so there's a, a correlation between expressiveness and intimacy between the forest and the household uh, continuum in, in, in this language. And I think that intimacy is a, a really important uh, aspect of, of expressive meaning, uh, whether we're talking about morality, whether we're talking about this, this idea of the, the round and bright eyes. Um, and so I'm thinking more and more about what, you know, what types of intimacy are seen in, in the relations across, across human and, and natural. So the, the approach that we've taken here is one of ethnopoetics, so reading scriptless texts, right? These languages are not written. Um, the reading these texts requires hearing the messages, which means that the sound is, in fact, the whole point, right? The sound element. And folk definition is the only way that we can get at this. Folk definition has been proposed as a, a way of, a type of, of dealing with semantics in expressives, which is a little bit strange for us because what else is there? besides folk definition in this kind of thing, right? What other ways do we have to understand the word, the, the, the meanings of, of rain expressives unless we hear from her what it, what it is, right? And what we've seen is that expressivity in this, in this talk and effect are interacting at three levels. One, the narrative performance, the whole, the whole story being told by the, the, the hunter in the forest in the bit language. A register of meaning, the way that Rain, as a semantic area, has all of these expressives that depict many different types of, of physical, social, and emotional things. And in a lexicon, the way the, the Sida language encodes intimacy relations across nature and, and humanity with a relation to forest and village in the whole lexicon of the language. Right? It's, it's encoded in the basic structure of the words. So to wrap up, let me say that in their discussion of effective communities, Kapelhoff and Lehman bring, back, bring effect back to Aristotle's thinking in tragedy. I'm sure we all know this, this thing, right? But it's very uh, apt for expressives as they work on principles of sound system, symbolism through iconicity and indexicality. But not only sound symbolism. There's grammar, there's morphology, there's word con uh, uh, formation processes. There is a grammar of intimacy, as described by Webster, <clears throat> that binds both speaker and hearer in the illusion of participation through expressives. We argue that the intimacy is extended further to include the natural environment that provides the physical, emotional, spiritual, and biological context for daily life. Schaus has argued that effect is abstract to the degree that it cannot be fully realized in language. It is reason that the body has a grammar of its own that eludes language because of language's inability to absorb pulses and discrete simulations, quote. We have argued that expressive meaning and the disconnect from prosaic syntax do allow language to make the connections between body, environment, and community in a way that transcends the multiple dualities of observation, feeling, speaker, listener, and human nature. We end with a reflection on the discussions uh, between a group of researchers that worked for three years on expressives in the South Asian linguistic area, leading to that dictionary and another book soon. The group was composed of linguists of various specialization, anthropologists and specialists in the analysis and translation of literature. At many points, the discussion of meaning crossed between the diverse languages of the region on the back of shared expressive forms. The group members expressed great discomfort at the notion of expressive meaning being about the description and depiction of emotion and feeling. It didn't fly, people didn't like it. We now, I think, realize that the missed point is that of transivity in the depiction of these elements of experience. Expresses work not only to foreground a special sense of intensity and qualification in the experience, but more importantly, the expressivity seems to cause the listener to feel something and to do something. Thank you. <laughs>